Now the Three Martini Lunch with Greg Columbus and Jim Garrity. And a welcome, everyone, to the Wednesday edition of the Three Martini Lunch, along with Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Good, bad, and crazy martinis for conservatives as usual. Jim, we start with the good, and as we have noted from time to time, we are now heavily into primary season for the midterm elections, and the one that many Republicans and conservatives were watching yesterday in terms of hopes of picking up the U.S. Senate was the Republican Senate primary in North Carolina. Several candidates in the field. You had to clear 40 percent to avoid a runoff. And the State House Speaker Tom Tillis did just that. He got well over 45 percent of the vote, actually. And so now he is going to be the nominee against Kay Hagan, who is obviously very vulnerable. The uh, governor of that state, Pat McCrory, is not super popular either. And I'm sure they'll try to tie Tom Tillis to him. Obviously, the good news here is that there won't be a divisive runoff like we'll probably see in Georgia. And so North Carolina Republicans can get a head start on coalescing and focusing on getting rid of Kay Hagan. A little bit of a surprise. The polling had uh, Tillis right around that 40 percent threshold. So obviously, he kind of you know, seemed to beat expectations a bit there. And obviously, as you mentioned, you know, avoids having to spend the next couple of weeks for this. If you're a, if you're somebody who's always identified as Tea Party and had a, and a bit of a, you know, a grinding of your teeth when you think about establishment candidates, I, I think it's very debatable that Tillis is, quote unquote, establishment. Certainly, I think you call him a rhino or a squish on that much. He has helped push through a pretty darn conservative agenda through the state legislature down there in North Carolina. It's also worth noting that uh, his top rival had a, uh, a civil suit that was filed against him that probably would have caused him some headaches in the general. So it may be that his Tea Party challenger was not a perfect vessel for the Tea Party message. You know, this now goes to straight to Kay Hagan. A, you know, it's going to be probably a neck and neck, you know, hard fought uh, general election fight. If you're Kay Hagan, you have to be a little frustrated by this result. And also, just to, very surprising on the other side, I realize your average North Carolina Democrat may be a little more, uh, a little less liberal, a little more populist, maybe even on some issues a little more conservative than your average Democrat in other states. Having said that, I'm kind of surprised that she only got 77 percent in the Democratic primary. And you might say, well, OK, it's a Democratic primary. Nobody's really paying much attention to the no-name primary challengers Kay Hagan has, and nobody's going to be bothered with it. Well, that's still 110,000 people. So that's, that's quite a few folks in, in Democrats who are kind of registering their displeasure with Hagan. Most of them will probably come home on Election Day. But it kind of indicates that Tillis has got a, a decent amount of potential for crossover votes. At least a certain number of Democrats who are not thrilled with Hagan, and uh, maybe she's got a little bit of a, a bit of soft base support there. So things are looking pretty good in North Carolina, but still a lot of road ahead to uh, to travel. Yeah, major expenses and major division dodge there. All right, on to uh, the bad martini now. And uh, President Obama yesterday was Jim focused on the issue that Americans care about most. Oh, wait. No, he wasn't. He was focused on global warming. No, make that climate change. No, make that climate disruption. An 800-page report on just how dire our situation is and how every extreme weather event we've seen is directly related to human activity. And he was speaking with many different media outlets in, in promotion of this new report and this new agenda, which is basically going to call for more restrictions on emissions and so forth. He was talking with ABC meteorologist Ginger Z, who asked him, How can we possibly do something about this? The good news is is that we've already taken some uh, big actions, whether it's increasing fuel efficiency standards on cars, increasing efficiency on appliances, uh, but we're going to have to do more. We also have a a chance to turn back uh, these rising temperatures if uh, we take some bold actions now. And apparently, no, he can't. Uh, We even saw this during the (laughs) cap-and-trade debate when people were saying, it probably won't even know much of a difference by 2050 if we do this. And uh, as you point out this morning, Jim, uh, in a piece by Ace of Spades, even folks like uh, NPR and liberal think tanks are pointing out, yeah, yeah, try to ease away from that rhetoric, Mr. President, because nobody's really saying that that's possible. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, and I, I come say this as a guy who is not a down the line opponent to all the you know, not necessarily the, the mainstream conservative viewpoint on climate change. As I've said, if you have 7 billion people doing things that generate carbon, of course, you're going to have carbon, more carbon in the atmosphere. The question is, how much does this affect the greater atmosphere? How much does this affect the climate? And, um, you know, are these effects that we can live with? Or are these effects, the effects that are going to be devastating to America and, and to the whole wide world? 
you look at this, and Obama is typically overpromising and underdelivering. As I said, the offsite. My my favorite statistic is just say, look, if you if the Western Hemisphere ceased to exist within ten years, the increase in carbon emissions from China would um, would overtake that, would make that moot. So I, I point this out, and, and you know, on, on places like Twitter, and dedicated diehard lefties will insist, well, we have to try. So we have to try to cease to exist and, you know, China will continue to, you know, generate as much carbon as they like. That is a formula for economic uh, hardship here and, and other you know, advantages over there. I think anybody who thinks they're going to be able to persuade the Chinese to lower their standard of living in the name of changing the temperature 100 years from now is uh, deluding themselves. And in this case, I mean, we shouldn't be surprised Obama is overpromising and underdelivering. That's the pattern of his presidency, whether it's a stimulus, whether it's Obamacare. But I guess we shouldn't be surprised that, you know, just saying, hey, we're going to keep it from getting much worse. Obama has to promise miracles because, after all, we are going to heal the sick and stop the oceans from rising. Right, Greg? Well, yeah, that's the promise I'm sure he's focused on, Jim. <laughs> Not just really stop them from rising. Now he's going to lower them. He's actually going to pull the Moses and, uh, you know, <laughs> get them to recede. On to uh, the third and crazy martini now. And, Jim, it's been fun being around the office the last few days and watching young kids associated with other shows saying, who would be a good guest to talk about Monica Lewinsky? Because they were in kindergarten uh, when this story happened <laughs> back in 1998. And, of course, uh, I, I've got plenty of names rattling in my head as I feel really, really old bringing this up, feeling it, like it just happened a couple of years ago. But, of course, for those who don't know, uh, Monica Lewinsky is back. She had kept a very low profile for the past 15 years. Uh, she's now uh, got a new Vanity Fair piece out talking about how she was used by the Clintons and uh, Hillary blamed the woman, blaming her, Monica and herself for for Bill Clinton's affair with her, and she obviously didn't have many good things to say about the Republicans back in the 1990s either. There's not a lot of uh, warmth for the Clintons, and the fact that uh, this massive baggage comes back up for Hillary just as her book's about to come out, and, and they're obviously trying to make sure as many people as possible don't think back to that era of the Clintons. Just amazing to get back there once again. I debated whether this really fits with the concept of the crazy martini. I, I suppose we should have expected this, with everyone kind of prepping for a... Uh, uh, prepping is a good word. It feels like it's a natural disaster descending down upon us, Greg, <laughs> the, the Hillary Clinton pre for president campaign. There was really no way you could go through a Clint Hillary Clinton campaign without Monica getting discussed at some point. In fact, there were a bunch of uh, liberal bloggers who liked uh, Barack Obama who wrote some really nasty things about Hillary Clinton in relation to the Lewinsky uh, scandal back in 2008. So it's hard to begrudge Monica Lewinsky, now 40 years old, now having spent, I think, a good portion of the last decade out of the spotlight, from the, the little preview of this Vanity Fair piece we got, trying to live a normal life and finding that to be very difficult, very often being told that there are a lot of places where basically they just want to cash in on her notoriety, uh, not necessarily wanting to let her do any other type of a job. It's going to be very frustrating to want to move on with things and, and not you just forever be associated with this event and have everybody constantly wanting to know that aspect of you. In a way, not really being allowed to grow up. I don't have much beef to give to Monica Lewinsky on this. It does kind of marvel, you look back at this, the way the left unified behind, around behavior that in other contexts they insisted was terrible and horrible. I think one of the things I noted over in, in the jolt and put up a campaign spot today was how many politicians, when caught in a sex scandal, have tried the Bill Clinton playbook and really not succeeded because, you know, there's kind of a unique set of circumstances. Democrats were unbelievably invested in Clinton's success in 98, even though they really shouldn't have because it probably would have helped Al Gore get a, a head start on being in the presidential race if, he had, you know, if Clinton had stepped down. I don't think we can look at this as a, a good moment in American history, although I think you can argue that in retrospect the right looked a little too focused on this in light of much bigger and much more consequential failures of the Clinton presidency going on at that time, most notably the very intermittent response to al-Qaeda that was a threat that was gathering at that time. So really, you know, a lot of lessons to look back 16 years ago. I don't know whether we'll have these conversations or whether it'll turn into the usual uh, partisan food fight that these uh, discussions tend to turn into. Yes, and hopefully people just get weary of the name coming up, not because they have any... Uh harbored ill will towards Monica Lewinsky, but if we vote for Hillary Clinton, is this the kind of thing we're going to have to endure for four or uh, eight more years? And then hopefully uh, people decide that that answer is no, because that's a lot of the reason, uh, as you said, that, uh, that Al Gore lost. So very interesting. 
Jim? We, we really should have closed out with some 90s music, right? <laughs> <laughs> to give us back that 1998, you know, vibe or something. Yeah, I'll try to or, dig. Or maybe um, uh, Lou Bega's a little bit of Monica in my life. <laughs> that was about the same time. I was going to think a little Ace of Bass, but you know. Uh, yeah. Wait, wait, what, oh, very good. One of the songs, by the way, I would not have played at the 2000 Democratic Convention was uh, Lou Bega's a little bit of Monica in my life. <laughs> Nonetheless, they played that and everybody danced to it. And the irony appeared to escape everyone. Uh, so. It usually does. Uh, Jim, talk to you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Greg. Jim Garrity of National Review. I'm Greg Corumbus of Radio America. Thanks for being with us today. Please be sure to join us again on Thursday for the next edition of the Three Martini Lunch. Have a great day, everyone. Mm-hmm.